Welcome, everyone. And uh, uh, I have with me as my very special guest today, Roger Waters, the uh, founding member and creative force behind Pink Floyd, but also uh, one of our, in my humble opinion, most important uh, social activists on the planet. And I welcome you, uh, Roger, uh, to my podcast. Thanks, Michael. I couldn't be happier. Um, let, let me just start right with, because we I am speaking to you. Um, we were going to do this in my little podcast uh, studio, but we are we are separate. How is this pandemic? How is it treating you? How are you treating it? And um, and what has it revealed to you? Um, good things, I hope. What does it reveal? It's revealed that I'm content with my company and my missus company and the kind of one other person that I see. Um, I've realized that I'm, I'm a more content, solitary uh, person than I, than I had imagined. So I'm, I'm taking lots of positives out of the fact that I've got a lot of, not well, not a lot of, but I've got more time to go, what shall I do now? I know I'll listen to that interview with Bertrand Russell that I've been meaning to listen to since 1957 or whenever it was, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, right. so, so, which is amazing that you can, I can do those things. Um, I'm not very, I'm not very uh, up on the pandemic because I don't watch television and I don't read newspapers. Right. And, and in consequence, um, my following of the story, such as it is, is somewhat sketchy. Um, but I know it's been terrible for many, many, many people. And uh, I know a lot of people have died in many, many countries. And I feel for them and for their families, of course. Mm, yeah. And uh, who knows wh wh whether we will learn any lessons for it, from it or, or what's going to happen over the next year or so. But the, but the uh, sort of um, forced solitude, though, has not necessarily been a bad thing. No, I, I kind of like it, you know. Yeah. A good friend of mine, um, I, I remember a couple of months ago we were having a conversation and he said, and we were talking about parties and I was talking about how much I dislike parties, really. And uh, he said that something that his old shrink had said to him once years ago uh, when he'd spoken about avoiding things, social gatherings sometimes. And the old shrink said to him, he said, you know, he said, there are very few people in this world with whom it is profitable to spend time. And I thought that was quite a way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I love and sing and chatting to you because you obviously, you know, you have a sense of humor and we are like, and we are kindred spirits. So we could be friends if we weren't both so busy. Yes. Yes. But I do. I do believe that we're busy people and, um, <laughs> it, uh, it, it, uh, yeah, I, I'm with you on this. I have found the solitude and, um, uh, the time to, um, contemplate and reflect, um, to be a very, a very good, peaceful time for me. And, and also like some, I think either great ideas have come into my head or some crazy ideas have come into my head, but, uh, but I think I may want to try something new, something different when this is over. I was going to say you crazy yeah. ideas. <laughs> I know. Wow. No, I, <laughs> it's uh yes. It, I just think that um, I don't want to go back to normal, whatever that means. I don't want to, I mean, obviously there's some normals um, that I, I, I will subscribe to. Um, I, I, I didn't get in on the rush for toilet paper. So I, I kind of lost out on that one, but um but some things I understand and I do, I do exist in the world uh, and I try to conform as, as much as I need to. Um, but uh, boy, I'll tell you, it's um, I've really been wondering about a lot of things, Roger. And uh, well, and, you and conformity are not two words that Michael Moore conformity, yeah. they're not like peas in a shell. In my view, anyway, which is very good because uh, uh, that's what we love about you is that is the nonconformist that you are. I've, well, I've kind you know, of you. They've sort of carried on a bit uh, with the normal, though. It's funny how normal has transcended this situation, the pandemic situation. Mm. Mm. Because before the pandemic came, the normal was, hey, 
how do we do this? I know we'll print money and give it to all the rich people. <laughs> Great. Oh, Christ, there's a pandemic. What will she do? Print money and give it to all the rich people. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, just like normal. Yeah, some things haven't changed. No, they haven't. That's right. That's very uh, true. Which is interesting. It really is. But the discomfort, um, you know, down here in the netherworld where ordinary people live, mm. must be getting more and more and more intense, I would think. I'm not. I'm not there. I'm not on the streets of Brooklyn, you know, mm -hmm. crossing the road to avoid the U-Haul trucks full of dead bodies. I'm, mm. I'm somewhere more salubrious. But I can, I can only imagine how, how desperate these these times are. When, when you live in a country with no safety net and this happens, it's mm. shockingly it's shocking. distressing, yeah. I would think. I think it's probably forced a lot of people, though, to think about, is this is this really the type of country we want to live in? Not that we're going anywhere, but I think that the um, level of of kind of um, institutional cruelty that exists mm. um, to where we don't even see a need to take care of our own. I mean, the, the, our own people here in this. And but I have heard from a lot of people who are who've kind of woken up to the injustice and the inequality of of how this thing is set up so that the poor people are the ones who are dying right now. The, um, if you're African-American, you're dying at a much higher rate. If you're in prison, uh, you're in deep shit and on and on. And, and the so-called essential workers who are, I would say mostly, at least certainly in the cities here, not white, uh, who stock our grocery shelves, who uh, deliver the pharmaceutical medicines to people at home, who, obviously are working in the hospitals um, who are still driving taxi, who are driving the city bus, mm. the subways, all that. Um, you know, the people that have to, that, that, you know, you and I wouldn't be talking to each other if somebody wasn't at some power plant, making sure the electricity was running. Um, a lot of people are there. They, some of them had to take the train, the bus to get there. Um, I think about that and I think about uh, how I want to live on the other end of this when we come out of this and what I can do, you know, to try and make this better. Well, wouldn't it be interested, interesting, rather, if there was a light at the end of the tunnel um, that suggested that there might be somebody in a position of power who might be able to change the structure to some extent so that people like nurses and, you know, and, and bus drivers and the people who work on the subway and work for Con Ed and, and the people who actually do the work that keeps society running got paid a living wage. Nobody mm. in this country is paid a living wage. Right. They just aren't. Right. You cannot afford anywhere to live. Certainly in New York, you can't. Right. If, if being paid a normal wage, like the kinds of wages that people get. And it is considered perfectly okay for this to happen. And strangely enough, they don't, they're, strangely enough, um, the people who earn their money and their living doing jobs like that that are not well enough paid do not rebel. They don't mm. rebel. Why aren't they on the streets? I, I've really thought this through a lot, and I, want, it, it really, I really wonder. And I think the thing is that they live in such fear because they're most of them debt-ridden, and they're on such an edge that they 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 can't quite make it um, to protest, to actually go, this is, no, no, I'm not going to, you know, we need, um, what was his name? Who who was the character in Network? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah, but who was yeah, the, what's the Peter character? Finch, Peter Finch played. No, uh, not the actor, darling, not the actor. The, oh, the actual character. <laughs> yeah, I'll remember his name in a minute. No, Howard, it's Howard Beale. Howard Beale. <laughs> yes. Somebody shouted that at you, didn't they? You've no, got... there's nobody. No, I'm alone. I've been alone for like 54 <laughs> days or something. I don't even know what humans look like. No. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Howard Beale. True. You know, we need Howard Beale. But, but of course, the the end of the end of network is they kill him. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> and and I think they kill him in order to get. To increase the ratings. Again. To increase the ratings. Yes. He suddenly right. became bad for business because his, I'm not going to take it anymore, message got to be more and more dark and yeah. more and more down. Yeah. And so that, that was hurting the ratings and therefore 
the network executives realized that they had to kill him yeah. first to help the um, ratings, obviously. But second of all, he was hurting their business and he had exposed to his viewers that the network, which was already a conglomerate, was being bought by another conglomerate. And, that's um, right. They, that's, that was a bridge too far. <laughs> that, for the, that, for the so, what, you know, what, what a prescient and interesting um, screenplay that oh. was. Petty Chayefsky, yes. And and maybe we've all become, in this great country that I live in too, we've all become convinced that this is a TV show and that we've got to somehow keep the ratings up and that nothing else matters. And, and in consequence, we're prepared to put up with anything to keep the ratings up. Mm. And, how, and how do you keep the ratings up? Well, war obviously really works well. Yeah, and, and uh, maybe maybe coronavirus will help. Pestilence, you know, plague. Um, I have no idea. I have no idea, but we we will see. It'll be very interesting to see whether there's an election this year. Do you think there's going to be? I don't want to depress people any more than they're already <laughs> depressed. But um, we just had the the Democratic Party here in the state of New York this week uh, cancel the primary, the Democratic primary that's, that's coming up. Um, they said the reason was, uh, well, cause Bernie has, has suspended his campaign. So therefore there's no need for an election between what is now between him and Biden. But Bernie said, uh, even though he's come out and, you know, he's endorsed Biden, he said, but it's, it's always wrong to cancel an election in a democracy, even if the situation is as it is. And nobody should have to go right now and vote in a polling place around hundreds of people, but, but they could have a mail in ballot. It's it you know on some level you know what I'm saying it's just the the idea of canceling an election is just that is something that should never happen mm. right I think Trump will use this it's it's you'd start the baby steps and you get people especially if you get liberals to go along uh, with the idea that we don't really need an election and we're at war and it'd be better off if we just postponed it um, is, that, is that what the thinking would be I think that's I'm pretty much uh, guessing that's what they're thinking especially as as Trump becomes more and more aware of how people in Michigan and Wisconsin, Pennsylvania are not going to vote for him. Uh, he will do anything to maintain his power and, um, you know, and he can make this work in terms of trying to rationalize it or justify it. So mm -hmm. that's why we have to start now, you know, demanding, insisting and letting him know that we're not going to put up with this. And that's why this week he praised, the um, militias in Michigan, these right wing militia groups showed up right. in the, at the state Capitol in the, went into the building, not with just with handguns, <laughs> which would be bad enough. They went in with long rifles and assault weapons and, and, and tried to charge into the lawmakers offices, all fully armed and in camouflage. Um, it was quite the scene and Trump the next day praised them in his, on his Twitter Mm -hmm. uh, they're good people. He said, these are good people. And the fact that Michigan is one of these states that allows you to open carry your guns wherever you go. Um, it's, it, uh, it should act as a frightening reminder and a warning. I think that, um, that Trump has no intention of leaving and would, would love the fact that he did, wouldn't have to go through an election. Um, I think we have to take that very seriously, but you know, Roger, I'm, all, I'm I've become more, I don't, I don't want to say, <laughs> no pun intended, that I'm gun shy of, of making these statements because when I've made them in the past, I have to endure an enormous amount of grief. You've done this yourself. You know what I'm talking about. When you decide to just speak the truth and you know it's going to be hard for people to take. And, and so I've done that for umpteen years in my films, tried to warn people what was going to happen. Uh, um, you know, the night I won the Oscar, I was booed off the stage because I'm, it was the fifth night of the Iraq war. And I, I said, this is, uh, this is an immoral activity and we're not going to find any weapons of mass destruction. This is a big lie that's been told to us. And now liberal Hollywood <laughs> booed me off the stage. Um, um, but you know, that was a time when Bush had a 70% approval rating as did Tony Blair. Um, yeah. they, they, the, the, a lot of so-called liberal people, um, supported Bush, supported the war. Um, the liberal New Yorker magazine, the editor of the magazine, David Remnick 
uh, wrote an editorial endorsing the war as the New York Times was all behind the war, having reporters invent things that weren't true, um, like the um, the centrifuges and all the way that Saddam was hiding all these nuclear uh, devices. Mm. All of this, and I and and I have to take crap uh, from people because they don't want to. Im- and the same thing happened four years ago when I told people on TV that Trump was going to win if we didn't get busy here. Uh, and he was going to win Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And nobody wanted to hear that. So when you ask me, do I think there's going to be an election in November? I want to believe yes. Um, but I know my gut, what my gut's saying. And, and I, and I now sometimes hesitate because I know people cannot handle what I call these awful truths. And, um, um, but you listen, you know this. Well, who am I talking to here? I mean, <laughs> you have spoken out for so many years. I, yeah. I asked you to be uh, in my Broadway show a couple of years ago. I, I invited special guest stars uh, to come on the stage with me uh, in each uh, in each performance. And one night <clears throat> you agreed to come on the stage with me. It was the only time in my uh, three month, 96 show run um, <laughs> that you uh, that I had to endure protesters in the audience. People had come in specifically because you were going to be there that day and started shouting us down from from inside the Broadway theater. Yeah. So you are no novice to what I am uh, talking about, and it's it's always I'm always trying to think how can I like I, I'm I'm you know I produced this film the f- a friend of mine made it um, ab- about you know, the, the climate issue is so serious and we're so far gone, um, almost beyond hope, not quite, but we're in really deep shit, um, with the, with the climate and the, and everything else with this planet. And it's like, Oh God, I don't want to tell people this. You know, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to go through having to, people just are going to be upset. They're going to demoralize them. But you know, the opposite, I released it, um, you know, a week ago and it's got, like close to 6 million views um, on on my YouTube channel. And so I realized, oh, okay, people, wow, they do want to, maybe the pandemic has helped. Maybe they do want to hear the awful truths. Maybe they will at least, at least start a discussion about where we're at. So you, mm. um, sir. Yes. Um, have been outspoken about any of a, a number of things over the years. Well, um, you know, it's funny. You, I mean, I have, yeah. and um, I'm prepared to talk about any or all of them. But what springs to mind now, because I've had lots and lots of conversations and talked to lots of interesting people and listened as well, um, not just talked at them, but listened to what people have to say on so and so forth. Um, and my platform has narrowed down to this tiny little thing that's, that's um, called Well, there's just several words, but the most important ones are Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Paris 1948. Does anybody remember it? There are 32 articles. If you haven't read them, go and read them. When you've read them, decide whether or not you subscribe to the ideas that are embodied in them, which is that it's what's in your constitution, I believe. That's right. Uh, uh, But I have a copy of this, by the way. Yeah, the Universal De- Declaration of Human Rights. I have a copy of it. I, okay. I have it in my living room. Um, I encourage people to read it. In fact, Good. I have more I'm than one copy, and, and I get, I give, I give it out to people. I'm very um, glad to hear that. But this is my point. Well, so when, when, because this cuts lots of conversations very, very short, um, and they, they, they won't just be conversations which I have with people about Israel and Palestine, because clearly, if you believe in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then how can it possibly be subscribed to or can it be enforced? Well, then you have a conversation about international law and then and you get onto the International Courts of Justice, the ICJ, and then you got on uh, then you get onto the ICC, the International Criminal Court. And then you get onto to um, the fact that the United States of America is not a signatory to any of the agreements that pertain to the idea that there might even be such a thing as international law, not signatory to the Treaty of Rome, doesn't believe in. In fact, the ICC is roundly attacked by the current administration. Sometimes previous administrations have been 
more circumspect in their attacks upon the idea of international law, but nevertheless have flouted it, flouted it shockingly. Mm. So, so, there's, so I'm talking about the United States of America here now. So when you speak to most Americans and you say, what do you think your country stands for? They, will spe- spe- me- they won't say, well, obviously, um, attachment to the bottom line, which is the basis of corporate law. What do you mean? Well, the only responsibility that a corporation has is to maximize the profit for its shareholders. Well, you mean corporations have no social responsibility? None. Well, does the government? Not really. The government's job is to support the corporations. You can see that. You only have to look at the policies and see what they actually do. They support the corporations. They support the very wealthy. They support. So, so okay, well, what, else, what, what do you think it might be about? Well, it's about liberty and freedom and democracy. and That's why we are the shining city on the hill. And, you know, that's with this wonderful example. to the and, and you kind of, either you leave the room because there's no point in listening to this garbage, or you speak to people and you say, but that's not true. The United States of America has no interest in human rights, none. And it, now, well, who knows whether it ever did, but it's very unlikely if you read the history that you could believe such a thing. And people look at you flabbergasted with their jaws hanging open as if you're insane. Yeah, but we do. We go all around the world trying to help democracy. No, you don't. You go all, the ro- all around the world supporting right-wing fascist dictatorships against the wills of the people who live in the countries. And you could rattle, I could rattle off the names of half a dozen countries where that is happening today, mainly in South America. But also there's huge support now for Hungary, for Orban. Israel is a perfect example. Fascist, right-wing, apartheid state, no interest in human rights, supported to the tune of $3 billion a year or whatever it is by the United States of America. Well, you can't have it both ways. Either you believe in human rights or you don't. And you can't say, well, we believe in human rights for us. We believe in human rights for Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg, you know, but we don't believe in human rights for the bus drivers or for all the people who don't have any health care. Of course, the pandemic was going to be awful in America. There's no health system. You don't have one. Yes, we do. We have the best health service in the world. We have the best doctors and the best research and the best. Yeah, but it's only for the very rich, dopey. You don't actually have a health service. You don't have a nationalized service that looks after the people, the citizens. You do not look after us. Well, well, you don't. And everybody knows it. If you look at, if you look at lists of um, health care, in the developed world or whatever. I, I can't remember where the United States is, but it's like 37th or something. It, yeah, it's, 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 uh, between, I mean, it's, it's just it's below Cuba. between <laughs> Zaire and Uzbekistan. Yes. Actually, <laughs> Uzbekistan probably has a yes. better health service. Right. But you don't. You don't care about people at all. Not at all. You care about Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg. So if that's how you want to live, all right, live like that. But, of course, the reason that the many people who don't want to live like that, or if they do, what a streak of masochism must run through this society that people will accept such a thing. If they do, then you go, all right, well, that, that would explain why that's how you live. But if you don't, you are many. There's 300 million of you, for goodness sake, get together and go, no. This is not the life we really want. We want a life that is more equitable. I don't want to see. I don't want to see ex-servicemen. Every time you pass a homeless person on the street, the odds are about five to one on that it's a veteran who's completely screwed up with PTSD because he was sent abroad to kill brown people in an immoral wildly costly, insane war crime like the invasion of Iraq. You mm-hmm. you, men- you mentioned George W. and and um, and Tony Blair. You know why aren't they in prison? Mm-hmm. They're criminals. criminals. They should yeah. not be walking around in public. They should be locked up. They killed millions of people. Right. They just right. Did- and so do we. Ca- 
Mm. So this is the, the the elephant in the room is the inability of people to actually c- consider who they really are, what their country really is, what it really does, and whether that is what they want or not. So that's why my tiny platform is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'll shut up now. No, no, don't. <laughs> You've been listening to Roger Waters here on Rumble. <laughs> Thank you. No, don't leave us yet. Um, because I, I want you, as I, I, if you don't mind me calling you an outsider, I don't think you're, you haven't switched over. You haven't switched teams, right? You're not, I don't think you're an American citizen, but you're welcome to if you are. Um, mm. um, I, I, I would find that tough, but um, I have, it's a long, 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 long history. I've, I've got this real love hate relationship with this great country, and it is a great country, and I love the people, and the, at heart, the American people. Oh, such good people. It's yeah. so shocking to see that they've had their goodwill subverted by the propaganda that they, that they listen to every day. And by, I think, a, yes, I think that's it. I think that that goodwill and that is in the heart of most is. American people is um, subverted. It's abused. It's used. It's manipulated uh, yeah. over and over again. And the people are brought into a big con. And, um, and it's it's sad. And what you just said a couple of minutes ago about um, how we put up with this and how we like just that word, a health system that we think we've <laughs> we're constantly told and we repeat this line that we have the greatest health system in the world. When just in that sentence, the word system, it doesn't exist. There's no national system by which to take care of our people when they get sick. There is a system, though to take away their homes if they don't pay the hospital bill. There is a system set up for that. Yeah. But a system to take care of you without you having to worry about paying a bill, uh, losing your home, going bankrupt, um, th- th- that doesn't exist. And I think, Roger, really, during, again, the pandemic has revealed how broken, how broken it all is. Um, and this whole thing that the Democrats during their debates, all the Democrats, but Bernie and, and Elizabeth really were saying, you know, we, we, I, yes, I'm for universal health care, but we can't take away people's private health insurance. They, they love their private health insurance. And it's like, who are these people? Nobody loves their insurance company. They love their doctor. Maybe, uh, they love the nurses in the hospital for taking care of them. But, but so all of a sudden, how many millions now? 25, 30, 35, officially millions of people that are now unemployed. And what happens when you lose your job? There goes the health care. It's gone. And there's no system set up to then provide you with health care n- now that you're unemployed. So people have gotten a huge wake up call in the last month when they yeah. have found themselves without a job, which means without any health insurance. Yeah, but they, Michael. It, this isn't just come on because uh, it didn't just happen. Yeah, you know, it didn't. It didn't just happen. People, people always knew. People did not go to the. People don't go to the doctor. They just don't go to the doctor. They, it's they can't afford it. That's and if why they, they don't go. Even yeah, if, no. Even if they have uh, health insurance, if they get really sick, they're done. It's yeah. over. Right. You're skin. You're penniless. What do it's, you do then? You borrow money, and right. then you're a slave. For the rest of your life, you're in debt forever. Yeah, in debt and, forever, and and that's where. Anyway, I, I don't want to sound all kind of whiny about it, but no, 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 you don't. It's it's good to hear from from a sort of a you know from a forty thousand foot <laughs> viewpoint from a lens that your lens mm. as to what you see. You love the people of this country, and I know I know this about you. You feel awful for the amount of abuse that people would have to suffer when they live in the richest country on the planet and the system, the real system that's set up uh, to demoralize them, to have them living in fear, constant fear. You know, that, the other thing, I'm yes. going to interrupt you because people would say to me, what do you like about New York? What is it? What you don't really like? Amer- you don't like American foreign policy. No, I don't. I hate American foreign policy. Why? And, you know, I often I think about it and I think, well, I started coming here in the late 60s or whatever. And then 
uh, I finally settled here for a bit after a divorce. I followed one of my kids here, a young kid. He was young kid. So I just came and lived here for a bit. And, and, uh, and I was working hard at the time. And I suddenly realized, well, not one day, but it, that I really liked the work ethic. There's a, there's a real desire to work hard. People in the States, they work hard and they don't resent you if you make a few quid working hard. But, and, and so there's a real like feeling of, Hey, here's a job to do. Let, can you imagine? Can you imagine if these 300 people were harnessed as a, as a collaborative outfit, all working? cheek by jowl, one for another in a sense of community where they were all looking after one another. What a wonderful, wonderful country this could be. And that's what it needs. But how you persuade them to demand that for themselves, you know, is another matter. I grew up in a country which had a national health service. We, it, it came in with the Attlee government in 1946 in England. So I was born in 1943. So my whole childhood, we had a health service. And now I have to say that people who wanted to subscribe to private uh, medicine and to take out insurance and go to private private doctors and things, they were welcome to continue to do that. And they did. And there was a, there was a big economy not nothing like the size of the National Health Service, but a big economy in private medicine that went on parallel to the National Health Service without anybody being screwed rotten. It worked. It worked. The two things can work together. So that stuff about giving up in private insurance is bullshit. But what's happened in England is that th what's happened to the National Health Service in England is the propaganda what war against it has been so intense after Thatcher and Reagan, who are the great devils of the neoliberal economic revolution, which has destroyed most of the Western world. So they, after it, they decided, hey, we should start selling bits of this off. Anything public, let's sell it off. Let's sell the railways to Richard Branson. Let's do the oh, let's sell let's sell these hospitals to these American pharmaceutical companies. You should watch and, and maybe you've watched it. I know you've made your own uh, documentaries about um, um, medicine, and they're very good too. I've, I've I've watched them, but John Pilger has made a documentary about. It's oh, called yeah. the Dirty War on the NHS. And it is heartbreaking. Mm. You know what's heartbreaking? I'm almost in tears speaking about watching one particular nurse who had worked in a hospital somewhere in the somewhere in um, the mid counties in Eng in the middle of England, and she'd worked there for 25 years, and it was bought up by an American corporation, and everything started to change. And after a bit, she realised that you were you got merits as a working member of the staff, not for looking after people, not for caring for the patients, but for getting them out so that you could sell the bed to a new patient. And, and you were graded on that. And if you didn't get rid of them as fast as possible, because they make the most money in the first eight days that they're in there or something like that, um, you, you start to get a ticking off from, from, the people that you know are above you in uh, in the hierarchy in the hospital. This woman is in tears. She had spent her entire career as a carer, somebody who loves her fellow human beings and who had worked as a nurse, and she loved her job, and she's had to leave because it's nothing to do with caring for patients. It's to do with making money, and of course the arsehole who owned the company and who sold the idea. To whoever, to the local um, health authority who sold the hospital them, sold them this huge spiel about efficiency and how it would be much better if it was privately run and how wasteful the administration was under the NH. And it was all complete bollocks. It was an absolutely filthy lie. And they stayed there for two and a half. This is all in John Pilger's documentary. He says it more eloquently than I could. They stayed for like two and a half years and then got out, taking a huge dollop of cream off the top and left everybody in the shit. Gone. Mm. 
will the investment remove boom, boom. Oops, and these were these were American investors and Amer- American yeah, companies. Yeah, yeah, it's an mm-hmm. American co- American investment company. What has happened in the UK that would even allow a hospital to be owned by a foreign private investment company? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I will put the link to John Pilger's documentary please on my do. podcast please site. Do. So anybody listening to this afterwards, uh, you know, please, along uh, with you, John, it, it John is one of my big big heroes. He's He's, I've known him for 40 years, and he's spent, he's spent his entire life, like you, trying to tell us the truth about, um, about some of these things that make life unbearable. Not for me, but for many, many, many people, they make life unbearable. And what makes life unbearable is profit, 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 mm. profit. People wanting to take more out of something than they put into it. And that being and that being considered absolutely the best thing that anybody could do in the world. So we pay people who shuffle paper money about more than we pay doctors or nurses or teachers or university professors or rock stars or poets or musicians or anybody. In fact, the people the creative people in society are, are, they say, what are you talking about? Well, you know. Junk bonds are creative. You can make money from nothing. You can make yourself very, very rich. Yeah, but you make other people very, very poor. Oh, that's the whole point. That's what it's for. Hmm. Well, that's it. And that is what it's for. Yeah, it's just. Don't weird. you think that as long as long as we have this system that's based on profit and uh, growth and greed, that um, all these all these societal issues and ills that we have, are not going to get corrected, whether it's the healthcare system, whether it's uh, climate change, all these things that unless you go at the core, right at the heart of the evil, um, it's just, we're just going to spin our wheels for so long. The the real core of the evil is that the they in this, which, which is probably the PR industry, have persuaded almost everybody that you see on the street or anywhere uh, in this great country, and it is a great country, that anything that has this word, the S word attached to it, is death. It's the plague. And the word is socialism. Socialism. <laughs> no, no, don't say it. Don't say it on my podcast, please. Well, exactly. Socialism is great. What it means is looking after the citizens, having a safety net, having a health service, having pensions, being able to retire when you're 65 and and enjoy gardening, not having to live in a effing tent or the boot of your car, even though you might be doing two jobs and so might your wife and your kids because they only get paid 15 bucks an hour and nobody can survive on it. And they think it's all right. Jeff Bezos thinks it's fine. So does the Walmart guy. They all do. They think, why are they complaining? <laughs> well, the, <laughs> right. And it's and it's always amazing to me how the profiteers will always find a way to make a buck, even in the things that they disagree with. Socialism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, this that what that isn't. Is it is that such a dirty word in why Europe? Do people, why do people who uh, who otherwise you would think were vaguely intelligent tell me, well, Sanders could never get elected? I go, what are you talking about? He was the he's the only one who had any chance of getting elected against Trump because he's a genuine bloke who genuinely represents some of the needs of the working people of America. And the working people of America represent about 95% of them, poorly yeah. paid people in America. Yeah. And Bernie, actually, I believe him when he says he cares about them. And when he says yeah. he believes in a health system, and when he believes in a safety net, and when he believes in welfare and whatever. And they say, well, obviously it can't possibly ever get elected socialism Mm -hmm. no what is it i don't get it michael you're an american explain it to me what are people frightened of that's have they ever been to denmark no they don't even know where denmark is you know this is one of the problems is there is a supreme 
ignorance that is manifest. And they it did a poll. Pain. They did a poll amongst the American people, and right. when they asked them, where to, they showed them a map of the world and asked them where the UK was. The first of all, they had to quit saying UK. You had to say England. Uh, where is England? Sixty percent of the American public could not find England on the map. Eighty percent could not find Iraq on the map. And my, when that and this happened right around the Iraq War, and I said, "Really, folks, my fellow Americans, um, can we just make a rule that if we don't know where the country is we're invading, we're not allowed to invade it? Just, just a, a flat rule uh, that if the majority of our people don't know where the country is, no part of this, Roger, is because." Um, we don't get to see the world. Most Americans don't leave the United States. I think 60 to 70% of the American public does not have a passport, never leaves uh, the United States. And um, well, that's because they've only just got there. Most yeah. of them. And they're, try they're trying to enjoy the fruits of the labor of traveling from wherever they've come from. You know. Oh, you mean because we're a nation of people that are from everywhere? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes, apart from the native, apart from your native population, and the who, descendants of slaves. Yes, correct. And the descendants of slaves, exactly. Right. Um, but I think, yeah, the why of why it is is um, the propaganda. You said it. The PR that um, that convinces people that things are a certain way, and this is the way. I mean, every time we've tried to get any health care, real health care passed in this country, uh, they run commercials of Canadians who are dying while they're waiting in line to see a doctor. And <laughs> it's like the Canadians watch it. You know, they have such a great sense of humor up there. Um, they, they watch it and they get such a kick. I said, you guys have got to stop laughing and make your make some spots and show them in the U.S. to tell people not only are you not waiting to see a doctor, um, you, you live four years longer than we do. Um uh, you know, you have one of the best healthcare systems in the world, but um, no, I think that they've that uh, Bernie, um, the propaganda machine, and this time this these were so-called liberals. Now I put quote marks around the word liberal, uh, uh, Democrats who were hell bent. I mean, when you had at the beginning of the campaign Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden saying that if Bernie became the nominee, they don't know if they could actually support him or work for him or, or even vote for him. Um, they were saying when they said those lines, and both of them said it, uh, that they would rather have Trump uh, than Bernie Sanders. Yeah. That that Bernie Sanders represented um, a a full frontal attack on the millionaires who fund their campaigns and fund them, and um, and that's why he became he was dangerous. And um, and then everybody started saying the same thing about he can't win, you know. Biden will have a better chance of winning. I never believe that. I don't believe it to this hang day. On, hang on. Did both yeah. Hillary and Biden. Both Hillary and Biden. They both, both, they both, both admitted se that. Separately. Yes. They yep. both separately yeah. said. Yeah. And, and they weren't talking like privately at a dinner somewhere in a little mm. corner in the restaurant. <laughs> they said this publicly. And there was such a revolting response to it amongst all kinds of people that they both had to walk it back. Um, but it, the genie was out of the bottle of where their belief system really was, that it would be worse to have Bernie Sanders than Donald Trump. Where are um, you, Michael? Can I ask you yeah. a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you on this thorny question? Because I'm, I'm, I'm on the on the fence about very little in this life, and I can't vote in America because I'm not a citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm quite happy about that, but I can still think about these things, and um, and and it's the, you know. It's the what do you just hold your nose and and uh, and ignore the smell and vote because it's not Trump or what? I know um, Chomsky, I know, comes down very strongly. He did in he did in saying vote for Hillary in 2016. I know you were as well, though. Maybe you don't. Uh, maybe your nose isn't as sensitive to Hillary as mine is. But uh, there's this thing of of what what what? What option is there for people who go, this is insane. There is no candidate. There's no candidate. They're all insane. Certainly these two are, Biden and Trump. Yeah. Are We're, well, and you say, those well, of you us, have to pick the lesser of yeah. the two evils and vote. No, no, no. I've never believed in the lesser of two evils. I believe actually what we're often faced with on the ballot is the evil of two lessers. Um, that is really, I think, what we're often having to 
right. to vote for here. So what I, you tell so your fellow what I do? Americans? Well, I, what I said uh, when I was out campaigning with Bernie, and he said it, is yeah. that we're going to vote for whoever has the D by their name on the ballot. And um, I have not come out and formally, not that anybody's waiting, uh, endorsed uh, Joe Biden. Um, but I, um, if you're, if the question is, uh, which is the worst, Biden or, or Trump? Well, obviously the answer is Trump. And, um, but I hate playing that game. Quick, who's worse, Hitler or Mussolini? Well, okay. I yeah. guess if you got a gun to my head. But seriously, folks, it's like it comes back to the propaganda again and yeah. everything that's happened in the last couple of hundred years in America, where they've worked and worked and worked on this. And it, the machine has slowly developed, but it's not the whole thing with the mainstream media isn't new. You know, the, right, the but I just can I finish Roger, uh, what I was saying? I just, yeah, I just sorry, want to make no. it clear so people are listening that yeah. we have to get rid of Trump no matter what. And what they, they um, you know, I've, I've um. They ran that, you know, that robot vacuum. They somebody did an actual poll. It's called the Roomba. It just go, it goes around the floor and vacuums on its own. Um, so yeah. if the vote was between the Roomba or Trump, who would you vote for? And the Roomba won. So basically, I'm with that. I'm with that group of people that's like, it doesn't, you know, it almost doesn't matter what the name is or what the functioning is. Uh, everybody has seen. Nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody has seen the what is called kindly the cognitive decline um, of uh, Joe Biden. And so he, they bring him out for maybe seven or eight minutes with a teleprompter. I don't know how that's going to work in the debates, but, um, you know, I think that it doesn't, it doesn't matter on some level that we have to get rid of Trump. But having said that, let me also say this again, and this is just going to upset people. So I'm just so I figure I have to put a trigger warning out now before anything I say or do, because I'm only speaking what I believe is the truth. And it's, that doesn't go through a filter and I work for no one. And I'm owned by nobody. So um, I'm not so sure Joe Biden is going to be the candidate. Hmm. And I think when anybody who had decided that they were going to vote for whoever is the Democrat on the ballot, that may still actually very be very true because he may not be the Democrat on the ballot <clears throat> for any of a number of reasons. Could be health reasons. It could be um, any of a number of things. And and the public may decide after the pandemic hmm. that um, the governor of California might actually be a better idea because there was somebody who uh, trusted science, um, shut things down. I think as of last week, I think a total of eight people in San Francisco had died of COVID-19. Eight. Well, that's that. I, I mean, I, I'm not privy to these things. So uh, I, I don't know about that. I I, I just um, I feel really, really. I sad. think anything can happen this year. Is what I'm saying. Man, okay. At the beginning of the year, we were in a whole different place, and anything can happen. And I agree we should, with you. We should be ready hard, for that. It's hard to imagine anything worse than Trump going on being the president of the United States. Excuse yeah. me for laughing. No, no, that is. I know <laughs> the human brain has not developed enough. <clears throat> at this point in our evolution to imagine actually something worse than Trump as the president uh, of the United States. I, I think most people are probably yeah. in, a, in agreement with that. But, um, you know, who, who I was thinking yeah. of when I interrupted you before, and I'm sorry, Ian, and thank you for uh, explaining your position clearly. Um, who was the guy who uh, the Republicans have used a lot in campaigns? And, and his name is slipping away, but he made Frank, Frank Luntz. Is it Frank Luntz? Did Frank <clears throat> Luntz work for Philip Morris or the big tobacco companies back in the day? There's one who's famous for selling the idea to women that it was cool to smoke cigarettes. And maybe single-handedly with that TV campaign back in the 50s killed 30 million women. I should do a whole podcast on this because um, the way propaganda and PR has worked on behalf of of the bad people. Basil, are you listening to this where you are? Do you know who he's talking about? I believe it's uh, Edward Bernays. That's We're, correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah. If that and Roger, what does Basil win? <laughs> well, the, the, the only reason I know that is because the great Adam Curtis made a movie about uh, 
the public relations industry and it, and it featured Bernays. Another a British filmmaker. You know him? Of course I know him. Bitter Lake, Dopey. <laughs> <laughs> Bitter Lake is an amazing film about the relationship between FDR and uh, you know, and King Farouk or whoever it was at the beginning of the shenanigans with um, Saudi Arabia, or the beginning of Saudi Arabia, in fact. So, right, it's, it's, and 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 about the development of the uh, poppy industry in Afghanistan, and on and on and on. It's a very interesting film. Yeah, again, Adam Curtis, yeah. British documentary filmmaker. Uh, we'll link to him. Is someone who. He tells us these awful truths. Like we all love FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, um, all the good he did um, for the world, this country. Um, and yet there's this story of how the Saudi Arabia that we know now sort of essentially came into existence um, with the help of FDR. And you know how people are, Roger, when you, when you bring these things up, when you talk about people's uh, sacred cows. Sometimes there are sacred cows. I would say that about Roosevelt for me. And it's like, oh, God, I don't want to hear this. Don't tell me this. And then it's like, okay, go ahead. Tell me. I'm sure you've encountered that when you talk to people about the things that you're concerned about, that uh, people go, oh, Roger, please. Are you like not invited to certain dinner parties because <laughs> you're going to start talking about the things that people would rather stick their head in the sand over, look the other way? Absolutely. There is no question, but that people are, you know, when people have heard that they've had dinner with me or whatever, they are, so, some of some of our Israeli lobby APEC friends are completely aghast that anybody would break bread with me. Some people um, in restaurants that I won't name, but in New York have, or some restaurateurs have been told that their clients won't 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 go to the restaurant anymore unless I'm banned. Yeah, um, I know. I've I've followed you. I've, my, I've seen I this. Say that my friends say, "Are you crazy? He's my friend. I oh. don't care if you come to this restaurant or not." Right. Well, right. Um, you said a few minutes ago uh, you referred to Israel as a um, a right wing uh, fascist uh, state, a government. And so, <clears throat> obviously, certainly, I don't think they'll get a lot of disagreement with Netanyahu. From, you know, when you talk about Netanyahu and what he's done and how he's behaved, it's pretty god awful. Um, but um, but you've been concerned about this issue for some time, uh, as as have I. I first yep. visited the uh, what was called then the West Bank. It's still called that, but it wasn't Palestine yet. But it was the West Bank and Gaza back in um, in the 1980s and. Uh, Oh my God, Roger! My eyes were were open very wide uh, to what I witnessed, and it was just the most. It was the worst uh, uh, situation. I just couldn't. Um, I couldn't deal with it for really after months. After I got back, I was just like, what "I can is only my imagine, responsibility." I, yeah, I can only imagine. It took me another fifteen years to even notice, really, that there was a problem. So, to my eternal shame. So, you know, I don't hold myself up as a shining example of anything, but I think one, when you do find out about it, really, you, you, you are faced then with, with, with choice. You have to decide whether you have a moral compass or not, because this isn't complex. It's not a complex. Oh, it's very, very complicated. You know, the situation, Israel, Palestine, between the Israeli and the occupant. It's all very, very. No, it's not. It's black and white. It's cut and dried. It's apartheid. We wouldn't stand for it in South Africa. It hasn't yet been eradicated in the United States of America, but at least there are laws against it. At least here, at least the law pretends, at least. That people are treated equally. So, you know, it's completely different. It's completely cut and dried. Explain to people, though, what is going on there. So, should remember, people are listening to this that maybe aren't that necessarily involved in, in this particular issue. Um, um, you know, you're, you're talking to a, a fairly mainstream middle American audience in some ways uh, on this uh, podcast. And, yeah. and um, you know, I, I just, I'd love, I'd love for them to hear what you've seen. Um, and what and what you've experienced in terms of this particular issue, and and let me just preface it by saying, and then I want to come back to this 
after we're done talking about Israel and Palestine. You lost your father at the, I don't know, how, were you a baby? You must have been a baby. I was five months old. Yeah. You were five months old when your father died killing the fascists who were killing Trying the Jews to. of Europe. Yeah. So your father gave up his life and you had no, a childhood with no father because he was, he signed up in the British, uh, was it the uh, RAF? The No, he was in the army. He was, was a royal fusilier. Yeah. And, um, and died in the war, a war to, to stop Hitler. Um, so I think whenever I hear you talk about this, it's always in the back of my mind remembering that you have a certain standing in this, that, that at five months old, you had to have the sacrifice of losing your father, trying to stop Nazis and fascists and, uh, and anti-Semites and people um, hell-bent on eradicating the Jewish people off the face of the earth. So um, with that in mind, I, I really want you to share um, and, and explain to people, because on the American news, we don't see anything about this issue anymore. So I'd really love for you to, to speak well, personally to him. Well, I should just, my father was a conscientious objector at the beginning of the war because he was communist. He had become, he was devoutly Christian. And that's why he, when the conscription board came to him and said, right, you've got to join the army. He said, I can't kill anyone. I'm a Christian. And they said, I said, and eventually they believed that, he might not be malingering, which of, of course he wasn't. And he had spent some time in the Holy Land before then. He was a school teacher as well as being a devout Christian. And he had taught at St. George's School in Jerusalem in 1934 and 5 and 6 before he came back to England before the war. So he knew a lot about the Middle East and having lived there. So um, so they said, well, you could, will you do other war work? He said, I'll do anything as long as I don't have to kill people. And uh, so he drove uh, an ambulance in in London through the Blitz. That's where he met my mother. That's where he started getting political. That's where, And then in 1942, he he thought it all through and he thought, I, I can't do this. I, I have to go and fight the Third Reich. They, they are monsters, and I have to do my. So he went back, and he said, "I've changed my mind, sir. Oh, jolly good! Listen, you've got a university degree, officer material. So he did six weeks of basic training, and then another, however long you do, and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in this put together um, regiment from London called the Royal Fusiliers. And then he brushed off to um, it immediately to." North Africa, and then straight into Anzio uh, in January. He arrived in Anzio in, in January of 1944, on the 10th of January, and he was killed on February the 22nd. Anyway, so that's his story, which is- How, how, was, he, how was he killed? Uh, he, he was in a front, he was in Z Company, 8th Battalion, Royal Fusiliers, and um, he was commanding a platoon uh, that happened to be in the very front lines uh, the night that, uh, however many panzer divisions it was, attacked the front lines to try and break through and knock the bridgehead back into the sea. And they were told, I actually wrote a song about it, which talks about, you know, how they were they asked for permission to uh, withdraw because they were being overrun their positions were being overrun and they were told no you bloody well stay there and fight as long as you can and they did and they were all killed or captured most of them were killed mm. and um so that's how he died um fighting tanks you know with a with a Bren gun or a or a Lee Enfield 303 um in a foxhole um yeah, so that so that that was kind of the end the end of his story. How does that relate to me in Palestine? Not much, except that after the war, I'm, my mother moved to Cambridge and I'm brought up there. And we and we had we had one particular friend who was called Claudette. She was a she was a sweet woman, but haunted desperately because um, she had been in Auschwitz for four years 
And the reason she survived is because she was a doctor. And the only way she could, could survive was to help Mengele with his fucking experiments. You know, so, I mean, I, I remember these people just after the war and, oh my, you know, it was it was kind of terrifying to be around them. And, of course, because my mother was so political and so involved in good works and blah, 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 inevitably there was that book in the bottom drawer with pictures of what Belson looked like when the Americans went in and tore the gates down and things. I'm getting a bit emotional. No, 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 no. This is all, I think to me, it's all part and parcel. Okay. Well, of, so, of how did you become who you are and in the, in your infancy, um, in your childhood? Well then, well then there, there, there's that. So, and I remember Claudette's tattoo, you know, and um, I a was, number the Germans tattooed on her. Yeah, tattooed. Every everybody in Auschwitz had a had a number tattooed on them, and and it's you know, no Jewish person anywhere in the world would not know that, or would not know about it, or would not know somebody whose uncle or aunt or grandparent or co was one of those people, because there were six million of them. There were also you know six million communists, or and uh, you know and three million gypsies and whatever, but. Obviously, the the biggest crime of all, though how how you compare crimes like that, I don't I don't know. Was was the Jewish people who were murdered, slaughtered? Anyway, um, so after the war, so I grow up, and um, then I then I I'm, I'm sort of get involved a little bit in politics because my mum was a working school teacher, so when she went out in the evenings to um, political meetings, she, she would take me, I had an older brother, John, my brother John, who's still alive, I'm happy to say, um, she would take us both um, with her to a British China Friendship Association meetings at the Friends, you know, at the Quaker, at the Friends Meeting House where the Quakers um, held their services in Cambridge because the Quaker community were always extremely welcoming to, they didn't, couldn't care less about faiths or religions or whatever. They just they believed in their particular version of Christianity, and they were very. My mother once, I remember once coming away from there, and she said, "Now, Roger, you do know where we were tonight, do you?" And I said, um, "Yeah, we were at a meeting." And she said, "No, no, no, the building." I said, "Isn't it called the Friends House or something?" She said, yes, it is. It's called the Friends Meeting House. It's run by the Quakers. They're a religious group. They're Christians. And she said, "You know, I'm an atheist myself. I can't subscribe to their religious beliefs, but I want you to always remember this." She said, "They are very, very good people," <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. <laughs> You know, so it was. They are very, very good people. That the important thing about people is not what damn religion they are; it's how much heart they've got, whether they care about yeah. other people or not, whether they have empathy. You know, whether whether their love extends beyond their grandmother or their whatever. How, can, is your heart big enough that you can love somebody who is from another tribe? Can you or can't you? Obviously, it's something that, as far as we know, there may have been somebody called Christ in you know the first century AD who believed that because it's all over the New Testament. But you know, so so this was sort of dinned into me as as a child, and but it it hit a spot where um it stuck. So I've always so blah 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 blah, and then you know a bit of um. Debates at school. This house um, supports the idea of a world government. It's the only debate I ever spoke in. I was fascinated when I was watching this interview with Bertrand Russell the other night. And when he was 82 years old, somebody asked him, what are the three, uh, is there, what would you do if you had control of the world? He's, and he said, there are three things that are paramount. And number one is world government. <laughs> that was mm. This was in 1950, I don't know when, probably six or seven or eight, something like that. World, and, world government. Uh -huh. Yeah, world government. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, you have to have a, a kind of, a, some kind of federal system yeah. and based loosely upon the idea of the League of Nations or to look at later history upon the United Nations. So going back again to 1948. 
But there is no question but that we cannot have a unipolar world. We've seen what happens when one country thinks it can dominate everybody else, i.e. the Third Reich. Right. You have a world war. We've seen it happen now. We know what happens. And it is a disaster. And this is why these days now are so dangerous is that we have a unipolar world where the United States thinks it has the right just because it's richer and has got more guns and bombs and airplanes and nuclear weapons than it, that it can dominate the rest of the world and tell everybody what to do, which is the most disgusting political philosophy, well, certainly since 1933 um, in Mein Kampf. It's disgusting. And I, I, mean, I have no compunction in saying that. Oh, but we're saving the world for democracy and freedom. No, you're not. You don't give a shit about any of those things. You've shown that to be true. You've show, you just showed it just now by supporting the coup in Bolivia. You're trying to destroy Venezuela. You know, trying to destroy the the Simon the Bolivarian Revolution and to, the 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 building of a democratic, free democracy in this beautiful big country that just happens to have a lot of oil under the surface. Anyway, I'm I'm sorry, I'm getting diverted and I don't No, no it's to- not no, I think this is all this is all prelude to who you are and and why you came to believe the way the world should be and and how you are so distraught and personally offended by the treatment of people. And he called the Palestinians well, but any, I mean, the Palestinians, but, yes. yeah, I say to people all the time, it doesn't matter to me if you're Palestinian or Rohingya or or Ingwar or this or that or the other or any of them thousands, hundreds, millions of indigenous people who've been slaughtered all over the world since the 15th century. It doesn't matter. It's wrong. Genocide is wrong. So anyway. so and I And I believe that as one who... If if what happened back in the 40s, the 30s and 40s ever happened again, I would want every Jewish person to know that there is there will be at least one one non-Jewish person that will have your back. I will fight to the death to make sure nothing ever happens to you again. I will have your back. You need to know that about me. But that position has no credibility if I am not willing to say that to a Palestinian, to a Chilean. To a, a Cuban, to anybody uh, in this world, absolutely. If you are going to start segregating out those who you would support their their right to live, but not support others' right to live, how can you have any credibility when you say, "Well, I, I support Israel. I support the Jewish people." Oh, really? Can't. Well, I don't think you do because I. If you can't support that right for everybody, then and you only support it for a certain person or a group of people, the the bigotry of that, the inherent bigotry of that is so obvious that you don't even know what you're talking about at that point. No, well you've sold your if you if you've sold your soul um to the devil that is exceptionalism, the I'm better than you belief. Okay, that's what you do. If you do that, you do that. If you think you're better than anybody, any other human being on this earth, where, whoever they are and where, wherever they come from, A, you've got another thing coming because we're all African. We know for sure that we all, Homo sapiens is 100% of African origin, all of us. I, I, met, I happened to point this out to a, um, to a room full of Italian journalists a couple of years ago at the opening of a Pink Floyd exhibition. And my God, they looked surprised. <laughs> They're not used to being called African, the Italians. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's right. just me being a little bit flippant. But you're so right. You can, can't you see? How blind do you have to be not to get that? And yet Joe Biden I'm, says the other day, I will not. I will leave the, you know, the American embassy will stay in Jerusalem, the capital. What? What? Oh, so you're going to pursue those policies? I'm going to be the greatest friend to Israel. That Wow. What about the Palestinians, Joe? Do you care about human rights? Absolutely. I'm the greatest defender and believer of human I mean, this is what, you know, I'm talking about. So I don't want to bang on about it. 
But you were asking me about how I found out about it. Well, in 2005, I was doing a tour of Europe. Uh, 2005. Can you imagine? I somehow got through the 67 war and the 73 war without really reading a newspaper or knowing what was going on. Right. Just and, to- and at least one, if not two, intifadas at that point. Yes, exactly. Right. With this vague idea that somehow there was something vaguely um, socialist and uh, cool about running around in, you know, khaki shorts and leather sandals and living on a kibbutz and being in a community and all looking out for one another and it being rather heroic and pioneery, which was the story that was sold to the Western world after the Nakba. Okay, so leaving that aside, if only I, I got offered to do a gig in Tel Aviv. Well, I didn't. My agent did. And they said, I mean, yeah, I guess so. Why not? On the end of the European tour. And immediately I started to get um, emails and immediately, and they were from not just from Palestine, they were from North Africa and fr- from all over the Middle East and whatever. And, and I'm um, guessing they were from Israel too. Yeah, and from Israel too. From Jews and, and Jews in the United States. Well, no, this was when they'd, they'd asked me to do this gig. And I, I was, and I, no, and I said, yeah. So I'd booked, I had a gig booked in Hyakon Stadium in Tel Aviv. Well, one of the first emails that I got, or certainly early on, because it was quite an, it was a good, healthy batch of maybe 20 or 30 emails came in, was from Omar Barghouti, who's a very close friend now, who had, with others, had just started the BDS movement. And um, literally that year. And, and he went, this is a really bad idea and explained it to me and for all the right reasons and da, 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 da. And he convinced me to the point that I canceled the gig because, you know, Hikon Stadium is built on a, on Palestinian graveyard for a start and blah, blah. blah. And I, anyway, it's a sacred place and da, 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 da. And, but I came up with some kind of a weird compromise um, that seemed all right to me. I d- I'm not sure if it was or it wasn't, but it's part of the story. I'm, I, f- I discovered through friends a village called, in Hebrew, it's Never Shalom, and in uh, Arabic, it is Wahat Asalam. And uh, it's an agricultural community that is ecumenical. It has a mixture of Jewish, Arab, uh, Druze, Christian, and Muslim. Um, people who all live together in a community and largely grow chickpeas and all their children go to school together and they live together. And it's an experiment in how we could live together. You never know. This could possibly, it might be that Wahat Asalam could be a model for what the single democratic state from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea might look like with equality, equal rights for people. So we did it there. It's the biggest gig there's ever been in Israel by a long way. There were 60,000 people came. I think it was two, it was 2005. So I was doing my Dark Side of the Moon tour, I think, at the time. And it was amazing. It was a beautiful night and wonderful food and huge ovations at the end, of blah, 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 until I stood up in front of the mic at the end of the gig and, um, of course, it had gone completely over my head that there were no Palestinians there because they're not allowed to travel. So so it was only Israeli Jewish young people there. And at the end of the thing, when they were, they were all screaming and screaming and screaming in absolute delirious joy. And I said, I went, just a minute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You are the generation of young Israelis who must make peace with your neighbors and blah, 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 blah. And I made a little speech. You could have heard a pin drop. They went from, ah, we love you. You're the greatest thing that ever had. Oh, Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd. To, vroom, the portcullises came down. It was like steel shutters coming down behind their eyes. And it was one of the most chilling things I've ever seen in my life. I thought, oh, my God, that is unbelievable just because I suggested that they make peace. So what happened was I determined to go back. So I did the next year. I went on a visit 
not to play again. I knew I would never play there again until such time as there were equal human rights for all the people who live there. And I went back the next year and I was taken under the wing of a lovely woman called Allegra Pacheo, who was one of the um, people who ran UNRWA, which is the relief organization there in Jerusalem. And so under the under the wing of the UN, we went all around the West Bank. I'm sad to say we didn't manage to get into Gaza, which was difficult, but we went everywhere else around the West Bank. So I saw with my own eyes um, not just the freeways, beautifully tarmacked freeways with only Jewish cars on them because Palestinians aren't allowed to use them. I had to go through the checkpoints with the young Israeli guards who were obnoxious to us because we were in UN vans and they knew we were foreigners. But I thought, my God, if they're this disgustingly awful to an Englishman traveling abroad, who will imagine what they're like to the, to the indigenous people, to the people whose land this is, that they've stolen. This is in the occupied territories. And uh, I was, and, um, and uh, I had long conversations with some of the elders in Janine. And, oh, I, and I, got to know, I got to know a lot of people. And, if, and funnily enough, talking of Janine, there's a movie, and it's called The Heart of Janine. It's made by a German guy. I can't remember his name now. But it's the story of a young Palestinian boy who's shot dead by the Israeli army in the refugee camp in Janine one morning. Oh, right, right. Because he's playing with a wooden gun yes, in the street. Right. So they kill him. And what followed was that a, a Palestinian health worker in the hospital where he was brain dead persuaded his family and then they persuaded the imam and they persuaded the political bosses where to allow his organs to be harvested from his brain dead but soon to be completely dead body and distributed to children in israel and they agreed the parents to their eternal credit and 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 the and the imam agreed and there's this film about it, and you know, weirdly enough, his heart went to a seriously orthodox Jewish family say in Hebron or somewhere. Anyway, so it's a very moving story. So I was invited to go and speak to students at a, at a, um, a cinema school. So I did, and there were about 50 of them and about 10 teachers or whatever. And I walked in and they were like, their eyes were glowing. It was very like at the gig, it was huge hero worship shit going on. And I went in and I said, wow, it's very nice of you to have me here. What are we going to talk about? Well, you? I said, okay, how many of you have seen the film Heart of Janine? Hmm. They all, they, some of them knew about it. Certainly the teachers knew about it. Hmm. Not a single word. So I started to talk about it very slowly and very whatever, and exactly the same thing. The iron shutters came down, and I could have been I could have been in a room with sixty dead people. It was over. That was it. And I thought, oh my God! Imagine if we think over here in the United States of America, or me living in the UK that we live in a country that is ruled by propaganda where 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 the ministry of truth and big brother are in charge of everything wow please visit israel it is beyond all imagination how brainwashed they are yeah. completely brainwashed and completely incapable of making the leap of empathy beyond the iron shutters and i feel so sad for them I cannot imagine living in that prison and how ghastly it may, must be. And it, make, and it makes me all the more um, joyous about the fact that I know a lot of Israelis and people like, well, the Paleds, Miko Paled, for instance, who was the son of a general who helped his country win the war in 1967, the War of Occupation. And uh, in fact, Miko's father 
turned round to the cabinet and afterwards and said, this is the time. Now is when we should make peace. Now we can have a two-state solution. We're in total ascendancy. We can, we can get a really good deal and it'll be great. And the rest of the cabinet, according to Miko, because there's a book, you can, should read it. It's a great book. It's called The General's Son. The rest of the cabinet looked at him and said, are you insane? We're not going to do a deal. They're never going to have a state. What's wrong with you? You didn't believe any of that. Did you? Interesting. Okay. This is, you know, this is back in 1967. They mm. never, ever had any intention of there being a Palestinian state. So, and not, not to mention Miko, his, his sister as well, who lost her child. She lost, she, uh, to a, um, a Palestinian suicide bomber exploding a bomb on a bus, and she lost her daughter. And she decided to devote the rest of her life to making peace mm. with the Palestinians. And she does. She's an incredibly remarkable woman. I get emails from her most weeks. She'll send me yet more devastating news of how the genocide is proceeding and how they're being murdered week after week after week. In this, so th this eye-opening tour that she took you on of the yeah she took like, sorry right, yeah, back to that yeah so that this the, it's the year after that concert yeah, so the, now so we're now yeah. we're in two thousand six two thousand seven I and uh, so that's it I've I've never been back obviously I won't um, but since then I've spent a lot of my time trying to persuade others in my profession not to um, break the picket line not to go and to not go and perform in Tel Aviv or anywhere in Israel until such time as all the people are afforded equal civil and human rights. Ex explain to people B BDS. You mentioned BDS yeah. and that you became a supporter of that and, and what that stands for and what are the organizations or the, what's the okay. movement in terms, and especially if anybody wants well, to. Well, it's a movement that was started by, um, 100% of all the um, organizations in Palestinian civil society. So this crosses all the uh, demarcation marks between the PLO and Fatah and, uh, you know, and um, Hamas in Gaza and the government and the whatever and uh, Ramallah and blah, blah. This is everybody. This is the one thing that they, re that they agree on. Um, they asked international communities for these three things to boycott Israeli goods, but particularly goods grown in the occupied territories on stolen land, to sanction Israel, i.e. to not provide them with weapons so that they can go on killing uh, Palestinian people, um, at, and to divest from companies that collude with the Israeli government in the subjugation of the uh, of of the Palestinian people like Caterpillar and Hewlett Packard and uh, there's and Viola and, and a lot, I'm happy to say that a number of these companies have changed their policies because pension funds and people of good heart all over the world, but particularly in North America have said, no, we don't want to invest in that company to their pension funds. And so they pull the money out and, 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 and there have been a number of cases where um, the policies of those companies have been, directly changed by pressure brought about by this thing. And also there is this cultural boycott, which is what I've been involved in more, which doesn't single out um, artists of any kind, but it it, it tells, um, it asks art, foreign artists not to have anything to do with the Israeli government. Well, the Israeli government uses any, any performance by a foreign ar artist in Israel is used to whitewash the policies of the regime. So it's uh, the, the line is not fuzzy. Don't go and play. Just say, no, I'm not crossing that line. It's a picket line and it's a very valid one. And if you would say like, you know, I've seen quite eloquent letters written by Nick Cave, for instance, who I remonstrated with because he was going, he'd had a long letter from Brian Eno, who's on my side of this particular uh, fence and we both said to Nick, why, can, why, why, why? And and um, he actually wrote a piece in Rolling Stone where he accused us of being cowards, which I thought was pretty weird, but he did. 
And he then explained in a letter to Brian Eno where he said, don't you think it would be better to go and perform for the Israelis and for the audience there and mingle with them and explain to them uh, your concerns about the way? Well, hang on a minute, Nick. Why is this picket line there? Because the Palestinian people have asked us to put it there. They've asked us. They've said, please don't go and do this. We've written about it a lot. It's not. And so what makes you think that you know better than the oppressed people do what the best way is to deal with the fact that they have no rights of any kind and that they are occupied, that they are being slowly killed, and they will be and got rid of, okay, and that their land is being annexed and stolen from them methodically and has been for the last 70 years. Why do you think you know better and you think you can go and have a cup of tea with some students or a pop group in Israel and that that will make the difference? I'm sorry, but you're wrong. And if he was here now, I'd say, Nate, you remember we didn't have that conversation, you know, 10 years ago. You were wrong then and you're still wrong now. And you'll go on being wrong until you change your mind. Mm, wow. It's, um, it's, yeah, yeah, put yourself it, in their place, Nick Gave. Put yourself in their place. I, I wish I could get out, you know, a, a letter or something that I've written. I've written so many letters about this stuff. But who who are some of the musicians or or people that have um, <laughs> refused to um, uh, go there and perform as long as this situation uh, remains as is? Who have refused to? Yeah, we are, we are a short and glorious company. Well, Elvis Costello, although he, I don't think he says he's part of BDS, but he hasn't been. There are there are a number of other like Wolf Alice, and um, I'm very bad with names, so I won't be able to rattle off a bunch of Lauren Hill. I won't be able to rattle off a bunch of names. Some some rappers who said no, we're not going to that rap thing or that. But I'm ashamed and sad to say that the list of famous names. The one at the moment, Celine Dion, who we're having a, you know, there's a huge struggle with her right now to stop her playing in Tel Aviv. I have a lot of good friends in the BDS movement in Canada, and they are bringing as much pressure as they can. But we get, you know, as you know, we get this huge amount of uh, pushback. I was in correspondence with some people in Canada called um, Artists Against Racism. Uh, who wanted to pick a bone with me. And I went, are you kidding me? That you don't support the BDS boycott and yet you're against racism? Don't you see that that's oxymoronic? It's a total contradiction in terms. You're supporting a state that is completely racist and you call yourselves artists against racism? Anyway. The point, the point of, <laughs> right, the irony is quite obvious. Um, the, the, the point of, of BDS though. Mm. What's the goal? I mean, what's the stated goal? And when will you know that it'll be okay to go back and to be supportive of a democratic society? Well, as soon um, as everybody has the same rights. As such soon as, yeah, as soon as there's no exceptionalism, as soon as racism becomes against the law, like it is in this country or like it is in England. Well, there are conservative people um, who support Israel in the sense that they support Netanyahu and they'll, they'll talk your ear off about how they, um, I mean, there are people that will tell you that um, Israel is a democracy and Israel. Well, they're disingenuous. They haven't been there. They haven't studied it. They know nothing about it or they're just lying or they're completely disingenuous. Because Some examples of, of how it's not a, a true democracy in the sense There are 50 laws, and I'm not going to start trying to name them, in Israel itself that discriminate against the 20% of citizens of Israel who are not Jewish. Now, these are pe people who are actually citizens now. Citizens not, of Israel. Not refugees in an in a occupied and territory. The ones who never left, in, who, who managed. So their official, to their clean. passport says Israel. Yes. They're Israeli citizens, yeah. but they are Arabs, essentially, I would assume. Yes. They're Palestinians. Yeah. Yes. And, main, and there, are, there are 50 laws. Christian, and some of them are Muslim and some of them are Druze, but none of them are Jewish. Right. Yeah. And and so these laws. They're mainly property laws. 
They mm. can't buy this. They can't do that. They can't own this. They can't blah, blah, blah. They blah, da, 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 da. They can't. They have no right. So there are 50, 50 laws that discriminate against them. And if you asked Omar Barghouti, I'm sure he could rattle them off. I can't. Uh, you know, I... I'll put a link. I'll put a link on the site here so people who are listening to this can yeah. go and read that. Because I, I know there was one pass just in this last year, some awful thing that where they start, they stopped sort of dancing around. Oh, well, that's it. the national law. The national yeah, explain law. explain that one. Well, it just says that the state of Israel is a Jewish state and it's only for Jewish people. Quite blatantly, right. nobody else has any rights. But if, if that's a, if that's it. the law, if that's the definition out of the country, how can it be a democracy? Well, it if can't be, obviously. If we passed a law saying this was just for white people, United States of America. Or just for Christians. Or just for Christians. Yeah. That that just, wouldn't be called a democracy, I don't think. I Maybe I'm no, no, am I missing a point here. Or, I mean, what's the. Called, it would be called a theocracy. And theocracy. Not yeah. a democracy, yeah. If it's based upon that. And the reason there's so much. Um, popular support amongst the evangelical right of the Christian faith in North America is because um, they have divined that um, the Bible tells them that we can expect the end of times and that in order for the end of times to happen, which is what they're all looking forward to, particularly Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo, who absolutely subscribe to the beliefs that I'm going to tell you now. They believe that Jesus is going to come back down, but he won't come back down until after the Jews are reinstated uh, in Israel, uh, after Armageddon has happened in Israel. So there needs to be a battle. There needs to be a war there. But when that's happened, Jesus will come down and he'll take Mike Pence in one hand and Mike Pompeo on the other, and with the other evangelical Christians, they'll all drift off to heaven together and leave the rest of us for six months of purgatory, and then we will all burn in hell for all eternity. And that is what they believe, and that is what they're looking forward to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now, for any for anybody listening to this who thinks that Roger was just smoking something and uh, and made that up, um, I was. Not. I, 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 <laughs> I will post also on our site here that little verse that that portion of the Bible. So you can click, you can link to it, you can click on it, and you will see exactly uh, what Pence and Pompeo and these other evangelical Christians believe must happen. I think even actually sixty Minutes did a piece on this a few years ago, where they went and they literally interviewed all these evangelicals and said, "Oh yeah, that's right. No, no, no." The uh, we support Israel. It's not because these evangelicals um, love the Jewish people. I, I would, you know, I would not argue that point. Um, yeah. They just want all the Jews back for the big Armageddon they hate bash. The Jewish people, they hate them. They're the most un anti-Semitic people. Correct. Yes. Ever. I was, I was being they right hate. There. They want the Jews to burn in hell for all. Yes. The and people like I don't know what your faith is, but certainly me. I'm an atheist. I'm going to burn along with my Jewish friends in hell forever while yeah. Mike, Mike and Jesus are floating about. God knows what they're going to do together. Whew, poor Jesus having to spend eternity with Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo. God forbid. Not that there is God, <laughs> but you know what I mean. No, I understand what your what your what your appeal is to the to some sort of other force that could possibly remove Pence and Pompeo from um, uh, running this country. But yeah, the, okay. So so to, so go back to so BDS. The the purpose of this basically is to uh, put pressure in the way that the anti apartheid apartheid movement did on South Africa, put pressure on Israel to be a true democracy. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, do you believe that the solution, as they say, uh, is the two state or the one state? <laughs> is, two should states should gone. every two states gone? Right? They've 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 destroyed. They they never had any intention, and they, no. they, that's no. why they keep taking over people's homes, bulldozing them, yeah. and taking the lands from them. Right. So so basically, in reality, what what you would like to see eventually is between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Yeah. Um, that it's a democracy. By the way, 
I can't speak for the BDS movement because I know that the BDS movement officially has no position on this question. Well, they don't. Well, then, no. well why they, do they, they? Why do they say that they're boycotting and and, and trying to? Uh, no, no, they're disinvest. boycotting in order to get basic human and civil rights for the Palestinian people. I see. Okay. And to get Israel to comply with international law. That, but they're not specific about a particular solution. Then they're, they're not demanding a two-state solution or a one-state mm. solution. Mm. They are demanding equal rights. Equal rights. Yeah. All kinds of rights: economic rights, voting rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just like just like we would like to have in the United States, we'd we'd like to have equal rights too. We don't, of course, but right. It's at least in the statute book. Uh, that there sh that there might be equal rights for people. What is interesting is this. This is interesting, and they, and it is this. BDS is working, and we are winning. Mm -hmm. We are winning the fight. The fight is being fought on the campuses of the universities of the United States of America, and also in the Jewish community in the United States of America. You know. Uh, that and this is true. The the demographics are changing dramatically and very very quickly of Jewish American people who support the state of Israel at all costs, i.e., who support an apartheid regime. They are leaving in droves. That's why young people, especially, you know, for the yeah. first time this year, a few of the politicians skipped APAC. And went, no, I'm not going to go. I'm not mm -hmm. going. That's that right. was unthinkable uh, in 2006 when BDS started, right. which is 14 years ago. Completely unthinkable. You, your career was over. You were dead meat if you didn't go and support Israel at APAC. Well, that's not true anymore. It just isn't true. And and uh, so, uh, so... You know, th 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 things are things are looking up, and the movement is growing. I mean, I watch them. I take I take an interest, and I watch these groups grow. And these are brave young men and women who stand up to the reactionary uh, committees that run the universities, and they say, "No, we we have to have we," and they and they lean upon the First Amendment of the United of the uh, Constitution of the United States. And um, and they and they fight on and they make their case and and it's more and more I think they make a similar case to the one I make which is um, which leans heavily upon the the simple question do you believe in human rights or not because if you do you have to support the Palestinian people in their struggle for civil and human rights so it's it's you know it it's not all bad news in fact it's all good news such as there is of course we would all prefer it. If everybody's light bulb went on at the same time, we got rid of Trump and Biden and got at, at least somebody who's, well, Bernie would have been at least way, way better than either of them. But I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to um, some of the squad growing up a bit and bringing their brand mm. uh, more to the forefront of... Uh, control of uh, the house of representatives maybe or even you know let's get one or two of them into the senate so we can get rid of some of this hidebound um, patrician old-fashioned outdated neo-liberally economically awful yeah so hmm. so bds is that enough about bds yes but yes but i i before i leave it i i do want to talk to you about the personal sacrifice that I, I witnessed firsthand in terms of the way that you were treated, the way that you are um, opposed in vicious fashion. Um, yeah. What is behind that? What is the, and how do you handle it? I mean, seriously. And I, and I'm, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I handle it by being cussed. Um, I don't take well to being prodded with sticks. Uh, if you prod me with a stick, I'm either going to prod you back or I'm going to ignore you or I'm going to harden my resolve or I'm going to read more books or I'm going to strengthen my case or I'm going to lean back on 
what I learned from my mum and dad, which was that my mother, my mother once said to me, it was one of the great things she said. She said, you know, when I was mulling something over when I was a teenager, I think she said, you know, Roger, she said, um, in life, you're bound to come across things that you have to think hard about and make difficult decisions about things. And, things. and my advice to you would be, um, in the process of making the decisions, to do all the research that you can, listen to all sides of all the arguments and blah, 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 and whatever, and really try to work out what is the right thing to do. After that, it's easy. Just do it. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. You come well, to, yeah. this, when, once you've come, come to the conclusion of what's right and wrong. Yeah. Right? You just do the right thing. So the right thing is to stand with the Palestinians. The wrong thing is to stand with the government of Israel. So there's no, I can't help it if pe if people are dogmatic and unbigoted and supremacist and think that they're special and that they deserve more rights than their neighbors. I can't, there's nothing I can do about that except disagree with them. But I'm not going to stop disagreeing with them if they're nasty to me, you know, or if they say, oh, I'm not going to buy a ticket to your concert. Well, fuck you. I don't care. Go away. I don't want you at my concert. Well, I'm going to stop my bank giving you money to support you. Good. Go ahead. Do whatever you want. You know, you're, you're doing the wrong thing, but do it if that's what you want to do. I can't stop. I'm not going to curtail your freedoms, but you're not going to curtail mine either. This is what I believe in, and it's really important to me. And there is nothing that you can do which will dissuade me from this course of action. I don't care how uncomfortable you are. I mean, can you imagine the number of musicians I've had telling me, you know you're making a terrible mistake. This could be the end of your career. Your career can end like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I've heard the same thing yeah. uh, told yeah. to me. Oh, look, and, uh, I've heard that a lot from people, and I – and I won't name their names because it would it it would feel cruel somehow, and 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 a, and a bit churlish. But they're there, they're out there, and they and they believe it as well. And also, I have some good friends who said, who say to me, "Christ, I admire what you're doing. I can't do it. They'd kill me." And they can, they can kill people's careers. They do. Yeah. They kill them. Yeah, you'll never work again. Well, that, why do you think journalists aren't standing up for Julian Assange? Because the same thing is true in the mainstream media. If you stand up for Assange, they'll kill you. You had a the end of your career. You won't get that next plum assignment. Well, you won't be given that. This, you'll say, it won't happen. Like, oh, you stuck up for Assange. We're firing you. It would be, are you too stupid to understand that it's against the rules to speak out for Julian Assange? Mm. Yeah, I mean, am I right or am I right? Because there is nothing, you know, I, I've, again, I've written lots of sort of things about this to say where I'm defending Julian and saying he's a proper journalist. And sometimes it bursts out me, unlike the rest of you, there's not one proper journalist amongst you. How do I know that? Because if there was, you'd be on the streets going, this is insane. You, you're, completely throwing the First Amendment of the United States out of the window. You're trying to murder somebody who has committed no crime, none of any kind. These same journalists were very happy and willing to take uh, the information he gathered for them about the lies that sent us to Iraq. Uh, they published all of the secret documents in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian. Absolutely. Um, he, uh, that was okay. Um, and then, and then for whatever reason, I guess they decided, thank you for doing all that work for us. Now, who are you and to hell with you? Yeah. I helped put up the bail money for okay. Julian Assange, um, right. when, uh, there in London. And, uh, um, and I said to him at the time that you should, uh, let the prosecutors from Sweden come. You should be, they, you know, if a woman says something, I mean, you should, you have to answer questions. Uh, uh, women have gone for too long, uh, not uh, being believed and not, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, law enforcement work in, in their behalf. That's why I'm saying 
not just you, but anybody out there should read Meltzer's columns on this thing, and yeah. particularly the article in Republic three weeks ago that goes through all of this chapter and verse. And Julian Assange did everything that he could to cooperate with the Swedish authorities. They were not interested in speaking to him unless he went to Sweden. But they right. refused. Yeah. And that was wrong. No, he should sure. never... No, no, he could not go to Sweden because he would not. The, the Swedish government, I'm sure, and, well, I'm not sure, I'm sure, has had a, uh, a uh, an agreement with the U.S. government to extradite him. Uh, yeah. That was not, no, he could not have well, done that. The Swedish government but, refused to give him an assurance that he would yeah. not be extradited. Right. Because he said as soon as he got that assurance, if he could get out of wherever, blah, blah, he'd be on the next plane. And he agreed to meet prosecutors or anybody from the Swedish judiciary and or the police force anywhere at any time. And and they never answered. And do you so, think the, the British government is going to extradite him to the United States? Oh God, it wouldn't surprise me. That yeah. barrister woman is, you know, she's a puppet on a string. She's quite extraordinary. The yeah. rulings that she's made in that magistrate's court in Belmarsh have been entirely inequitable and disgusting. So... I don't know. How do these people do it? I don't know. How do they sleep at night? I can't imagine. They learn to rationalize it. I honestly don't know. But we will, those of us who are supporting Julian, will go on fighting fighting to the end. It's coming up this month. Yeah. If they do, it will be one of the most disgusting miscarriages of justice that any of us have ever witnessed. Mm. He hasn't committed a single crime. Not one. Well, one, a tiny bail infringement for which he has served 300 days in prison, more than that now because they've kept him on remand, in the highest security prison in the United Kingdom, yeah. rubbing shoulders with yeah. multiple murderers and rapists. And God, and the people have committed awful, you know, um, violent, violent crimes. I went to I went to visit him in London when he was in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy. And right. um, boy, his living conditions there were <laughs> what he had. To, I mean, it was a tiny, tiny office. Uh, he had some kind of handheld shower thing in the sink out of the bathroom, out of the toilet room. I did uh, a, I did an interview um, on Tuesday this week with Rafael Correra, who is the ex-president of Ecuador. Who was, who was the president of Ecuador when Assange was given asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy and also given Ecuadorian citizenship so that he could never be extradited to the United States of America. And that citizenship was rescinded by Lenin Moreno, the current puppet meinster um, yeah. and president of Ecuador, who is busy stealing money from the Ecuadorian people and shoveling it out to expatriate Ecuadorians living in New York City you know, in, in, in the form of um, Ecuadorian bonds. Mm. I, you can read all about that as well. It's yeah. all kind of public knowledge, but nobody's that interested except the people of Ecuador, I think. As you know, the bodies are filling up in the streets. It's, they're in such a terrible situation because they have no nothing, no health service at all. Anyway, um, Carrera's I, a good man. I, I would doubt <clears throat> him. I heard. I heard that you used to be in a rock band. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me tell you something seriously though. Um, the it um, obviously, I think most uh, people will agree with this statement that. Um, you and your cohorts formed one of the greatest rock bands of all time. And, um, Hey, why don't we get back together, Michael? (laughs) Wouldn't that be great? One last time before everybody's dead. We just happen to have David Gilmore out in the hallway here. (laughs) No, it's, um, um, the, but, but seriously though, all kidding aside. All kidding aside. um, Yes. Come on. It, it, um, long before Dark Side of the Moon, mm-hmm. um, the uh, there would be we'd have you know parties in in high school. This I graduated in 1972, um, so this is a year before uh, Dark Side, mm-hmm. and um, but we were already, <laughs> people were already playing already playing your music because especially um, everybody was getting high 
this was like the perfect music to listen to. Uh, so this is like, you know what I'm talking about? Early Pink Floyd. Um, not that later Pink Floyd, you know, uh, deserted that uh, ethos. Mm-hmm. But um, but it was, but when Dark Side of the Moon uh, came out, um, man, it's like, um, I felt really blessed to live in that in that time. It was a good that, record. It was a really good record. <laughs> My very, good. very, 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 very first wife, Judy, who who was alive, obviously then. She was obviously alive then. It was 19, whatever it was, 72 or 73. 73. When yeah. I, I brought a half-inch tape home, I think, or maybe it was only a quarter-inch, and played it to her on good on decent speakers, small but decent. There were Celestian Ditton 15s for any anoraks out there listening. And she burst into tears wow. at the end. And I thought, wow, we've cracked it. We've finally cracked it. This is really a really, really good record. Really good. It's really beautifully crafted. And it's well performed and the songs are good and it's about something. And it's, I was really, really proud of it. Still wow. Well, of course uh, you should be. And uh, it, uh, for how many years was it? It was on the charts for like decades. Until uh, they changed the rules and took it off. They finally had to change the rules, right? They to, yeah. The rules. yeah. They said, you can't have a record that's been on there for more than whatever. Cause it was like, I, I, it was like 980 or 1500. I can't remember, but it was like crazy. Every, it was a crazy yeah, number. It, it was forever and ever and ever and ever. And it was the record set the record for yeah. a record. So they, I don't think it's been broken. Um, they stop, it can't be broken because the rule is that you can't go from longer than 10 years or something. Oh, wow. And then you have to go onto the classic chart or something. So it's a different chart. If it wasn't, it would still be in the top 200. Right. Still, probably to this day. Yeah. It's because obviously it's still selling. What do you uh, mean, probably, Michael? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm trying not to embarrass you. I'm trying to give you some sense of modesty here. Uh, and, uh, and also be, because, because what you then did next, um, and this concept, and, and maybe you could, I've always wanted to ask you this is, mm-hmm. The, the idea of the wall, um, and if you're, if you're of a younger generation, maybe you haven't listened to the wall, maybe you have, but it, uh, but, but certainly anybody, uh, probably over the age of 40, um, mm-hmm. is quite familiar, um, with this album. And it, it was, I remember the first time I put it on my turntable and I, um, I couldn't believe humans could make <laughs> this album. It was so, it affected me on such a level and, um, and the sort of, um, I don't know how to describe the, the, the conflict within the album mm. between, um, if I could just simplify it between the sort of fascistic or the proto fascist way that we are raised, um, from, uh, the time that, <laughs> that we're little tykes and we're mm. in school. And um, all the way through until we are what um, anthropologists 100 or 200 years from now will refer to us as wage slaves. They will say that a different form of slavery took place where people thought they were free, but in fact uh, weren't. Um, And you captured this, this sort of this pantheon of our existence. And especially if you grow up in a place like Flint, Michigan, like myself and others, we just you know, and, and where you come from the working class. Um, and if you get it, if you get what has happened and what is continues to happen to you. I know. It's the only you, place in the world where you can go into the pub and order a pint of lead. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I, I, I know that's not no, funny. No, 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 I don't think you, no, no. I know how you meant it because I know how you care about this sort of thing, but it's, it is a, um, a tragedy that continues I'm and, sure it does, man. Um, um, the <laughs> those of us who grew up there, and those of us who are from there, some who still live there, um, but we know we know what another brick in the wall means, and we know 
we know how difficult it is when we have figured it out and we're trying to help others to figure it out, but, but to be comfortably numb, um, we know what that means. Um, and we know how our fellow members of the working class are bought off with mm. that, uh, uh, with the advertising, with the propaganda, with the PR, with the, with everything to just kind of slowly put that needle in their brain mm. uh, to where they can just feel better, just feel better. Just let me feel better. I can't take this. Except, of course, when you're numb, you can't feel better. So there's really, there's no such thing as comfortably numb. Yeah. Numb is uncomfortable by definition. Yeah, right. It really hit me the first time I heard it. I, I probably p played it three or four more times that night. Right. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I've always wanted, I've never, I've never talked to you about this, but I'd, I would love to just hear, you know, I'm sure you've been asked this many times, but y you're talking to me. So I want you to, I want you to uh, share with me the, what happened there, what happened to make you want to um, confront um, not just the pain, but the, all right. All right. the I'll tell you, there's, pain. There's, if you're really interested, there's a couple of quick answers to this thing and which are really kind of simple to tell um one thing is the story that i think everybody knows which is of the animals tour in 77 and feeling really i felt really alienated from the first stadium audiences in north america that we played to because they seemed largely disinterested in what we were doing on stage and were more interested in getting stoned or drunk or just looning around or making a noise. Maybe it's a function of the fact that although the animal show was quite spectacular in its own way, it wasn't enough to hold the attention of that many people for that long. So, so it was during one of those shows that I suddenly thought, hey, what? I had the idea of um, building a wall across the front of a stage during a rock show cutting the band off completely from the audience. And my original idea was that that was the end of the show, which I still quite like, but we weren't, <laughs> we didn't quite get as hardcore as that. And, but I had that idea and I determined to pursue it. And I eventually managed to sell it to the other guys in the band who I, um, they would all happily tell you, well, not Rick, cause he's, he's dead. But Nick and Dave, I think would both agree that they thought I was insane. <laughs> They really, they thought, what are you talking about? Anyway, I did persuade them, and it was a good piece of their Comfortably numb, on the other hand, is something that wasn't in my original um, uh, demo of the whole piece. Because I did two demos. I did one called The Wall and one called Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, and I presented them to the band and said, here, I'm gonna, I, I want to make a solo album, but well, so pick, take your pick. One of these can be a band album, and the other's going to be... And they picked the wall, which was great, and we and we made it. But I needed help, so I got um, a friend of my wife then called Bob Isra, in his name was, to come in and help me produce the record, which he did, because I needed I needed um, somebody who was kind of intellectually capable of and also interested in talking about the narrative and the theatre and all kinds of things that were in it. So. That's what we did. So we eventually get to a point where we've got a, a protagonist who is pink and he's succumbed to too many drugs and too much drink or whatever. And he's in a hotel room and he's got to go and do a gig. And so um, a doctor is called in by management. And um, we all remember this bit in the film, Bob Hoskins and, and Bob Geldof is called in to um, sort him out to get him on stage because the show must go on. And he injects him with all kinds of stuff. And this is the point where we needed a song for that moment where he's whatever. So, you know, I look at Bob and Bob looks at me and we go, where is it? <laughs> I go, oh, fuck. All right, I'll try, and, I'll try and write something. And then I remembered that I had heard David playing those these chords you know where it goes um anyway you know so it's those chords which are the chorus they're the chords right 
comfortably numb. And I said, well, what is what is that? He said, it's a chord sequence. I said, yeah, but what? Have you got any word? No. Well, what? how does it go? It goes, um, la, da, da, da. <laughs> I went, okay, great. Thanks, pal. He said, well, do you mind if I try and use it? Because I've got to write a song for the doctor. No, I don't mind. All right, good. So I boshed off in the other room where there was a little console. I sat down with the guitar and, uh, you know, an illegal pad, like one does, and a biro. <clears throat> and I started looking at that, those chords. I think I did this first. Anyway, I looked at it. And I'm, God knows how I came up with, there is no pain you are receding. I'm thinking about him talking to the doctor. So he's talking to the doctor. Uh, so, and I got, I got that first chorus down, out of me, and onto the thing. So then I thought, well, what's the doctor going to do? So, because there was no, that's it. That's all there was. So then I thought, well, what happens when you get, you get back to that D major? Where can you go? Well, the relative minor is a B minor. So, it, um, well, maybe it could go, hello, is there anybody in the, oh, yeah, this is good. Not if you can hear me. Oh, yeah, this is a piece of piss. So <laughs> I wrote the verses then. So those are my verses, chord sequence, lyrics, melody, everything. And it's David's chorus, chord sequence. Not nothing, nothing. And that is where the song came from. And it's how great. Long, how long did that take? What, the, 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 oh, the, about an hour. About an, that, your, that song. Yeah. Written in an well, hour. I have no idea how long it took Dave to go D A D A C G C G. All right. So a. that was right. Okay. So to ask him. You're given DAD. Right? him years. He's not a very quick writer. <laughs> okay. But well, you were handed that DA, DA. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's then an hour later, we have Comfortably Numb. Just about, yeah. Yeah, about an hour. I mean, you could ask Ezrin. Ezrin could remember it very. Probably Ezrin's version would be that that didn't happen at all and that he actually wrote it. And uh, I found it in his briefcase and stole. I've no idea. You know what rock and roll is like. Right. Do, do you guys t t talk at all? Do you have any? Who? Uh, Which the, guys? The three of you. The three of you. The three that are alive. I, I'm. No, Bob Ezrin and Dave Gilmore and I have not sat down together since 1979. Wow, that really is rock and roll. Yeah, it is rock and roll. It's Bob, the history of rock and roll. Bob, Bob Ezrin had agreed to produce Radio Chaos for me, with me. And that's my second solo album after Pros of Conservation Hacking. And I discovered, I, I suddenly I couldn't get hold of him anymore because this was in 1987. I couldn't get hold of him anymore. He wasn't answering the phone. And then one day he did answer the phone and he realized it was a mistake because it was me. And I went, mm. where are you? We're supposed to start in 10 days. Uh, oh, yeah, it's going to be really difficult. I'm this and that and the other and blah, 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 blah. And I had a quick sniff of the phone and I went, <laughs> oh, Smells like a rat. This smells like a rat to me. I'm smelling a rat here. What are you talking about? You've taken a job with the boys, haven't you? And he had. Mm. He had agreed to um, produce a momentary lapse of reason, but he was too frightened to tell me, quite rightly, because I would not have been blessed pleased. I have to mm. say. But anyway, wow. it's all water under the bridge, Michael, isn't yes, it? Yes, of, of course. And he's a perfectly ordinary human being, Bob. He is. He's, you know, we're, listen, there's no, there's no heroes and villains really in any of this. Right. Until you get to the real villains. Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, yeah, those are real villains because they're going to kill us all if they get a chance. They will kill every living thing on this planet. They will have a nuclear war with Russia or China if they get the chance. It's the Armageddon. They're, they're real they, villains. They, they but, but Esrin isn't. Dave isn't. I'm not. Rick's not. Nick's not. Sid's not. You're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. There are very few. We're all flawed, all of us. Right. But the villains, we know who the villains are. We do know who they are, yeah. So 
just to just to put a button on mm. on the wall and the concept and the whole the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, what what were you looking for? Not knowing that that a, a young Michael Moore would be uh, cracking open this um, three dollar and ninety nine cent album. Um, uh, not knowing I'd be listening to it, not knowing the effect it would have on me. But mm. but there. But all of us, whether we are filmmakers or musicians right. or whatever, somewhere in the backs of our minds, we know that the, the song is actually completed and the movie is completed when the individual who experiences it essentially becomes a participant in it. And, um, and I'm just I'm curious what you were thinking, how you wanted me or anybody else to participate in terms of just our own thought process. Um, we don't need no thought control. <laughs> well, um, you're, looking, you're looking at me. If you're asking me, when I'm when I'm working on something, I'm always looking for all the help I can get from wherever I can get it from. So one of the main contributors to the wall was Jerry Scarf. You know, there, there, there's something about his visualization, the marching hammers, for instance. Some of the the some of the iconic images that he came up with from that. And, and he came up with the visualization of, of the teacher and the this and that. I came up with the characters and I told him who they were and where they were from and gave him some idea of the motivation. But he, can, he invented the judge as the arsehole, you know, the singing arsehole mm -hmm. and, and all of that stuff because he's an extraordinarily inventive and creative man as well as being a great, uh, calligrapher and painter and artist. So, so there, there is, and also, I, uh, you know, I was denigrating um, Ezrin a little bit because he stabbed me in the back. And you go, why'd you do that, you prick? Oh, he did it because it suited him at the time, I think. And I think his moral compass is a little light on gasoline. But he was hugely important in the making of that record, and a, and a lovely fella to be around most of the time. As well, you know, good company, bright, clever, interesting, and all of those things. So life in the fast lane is just like life in any lane. You know, there's good times and bad times, and we'll make friends, and sometimes some of us make enemies sometimes, but they're not mortal enemies. And there's, you know, people make more of it than they should, I think, out of these things in my and the whole Pink Floyd thing has become immensely dull over the years. All this nonsense about us playing together. Who cares? They do. I don't. I'm quite certain David doesn't. Or Nick. Nick, I'm not quite so sure. I don't care. Um, oh, good. I'm glad. I, 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 don't, I don't care at all. But uh, I do care. I'm grateful for the art that you created art that yeah. um, put my head in a place to think about things and to, um, and to maybe not feel so alone there yeah. uh, in Flint and, and that um, when you give voice to people who feel voiceless um, it's a powerful thing, Roger. And um, um, you know, I hope you know that. I hope, I hope that, you well, that's very kind of you, Michael, and I, I, I sure. sort of do know it, but I, it's really lovely to hear it. And obviously, I feel the same about many artists, you know, who I grew up with or who I've listened to during um, during my uh, experiences as a listener. Um, and and so I know I know I know I know exactly what you're saying because there is something transcendental about a really great song or, or even a, just a really great, you know, I, right now I can hear Neil in that weird falsetto going, there is a town in North Ontario. Mind you, that is at the beginning of his performance in The Last Waltz, isn't it? He sings helpless, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he does. He does. With that big lump of coke hanging out of his right nostril, which they tried to paint out. Next time you watch it, You'll see it's flickering backwards and forwards all the time. Well, Not he's another he, he, <laughs> he's another one that gave us a lot uh, too. Oh God! Oh, oh, and still does. And still yeah. does. Oh, um, Neil, 
you know, yeah, he's a he's a, he is he is a national treasure, like John Prine, who we just lost. Oh yes, right. National treasure. Yeah. No, Neil Young. That 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 album he did during the Iraq War was uh, so powerful. I can't remember the name of it now, but it was. Um, and he did. He got Crosby and Nash and Stills back together to record these songs about yeah. what kind of country have we become. It's very yeah. powerful. It's it, all of this, um, and uh, um, so um, let me let me uh, before we go, I want to tell people that <laughs> you and I were supposed to be at South by Southwest um, back yeah, in March, right. and um, we were going to have a conversation on the stage yep. uh, together. And sadly, because of uh, the coronavirus, uh, South by Southwest was canceled. We didn't get to do that. Um, I'm I'm grateful that we you know that we've had this chance here. The um, have we left anything out that we might have covered <laughs> there, uh, or something that maybe that you wanted to say because they wanted to honor you and they've wanted to honor you. I know for some time there at at South by Southwest and yeah. your, your contribution. Um, and not just not just uh, musically, but also as you were saying, with uh, your your mentor, guru, designer, um, the you were going to go out on tour uh, this summer in yep. a few months, and um, I remember when we talked about South by Southwest, you um, had said you had told me about it, and yep. um, and that you were working with, right. Uh, I remember that day you were working with your the person that was. You know, you were kind of coming up with all these drawings and all these designs of what the stage would look like and how things yeah. are going to be. And it was a very, a very, if anybody has seen Roger in concert in the last few years, it's the, the visual of this is mind blowing. And, um, and of course the, the pig is, is always, you know, it's present, but the, the flying pig, um, well, you know, I don't, I don't do drawings of ideas. Well, very rarely. Well, yeah. So I, how did this come about? Because can I just say too, what the name of the tour was going to be and the concept yeah, of, course. Yeah. of this, um, uh, this is not a drill. Yeah. Was the name of this tour that, uh, sadly you've had to now postpone. Yeah. Um, but but also the way you why don't you, I'm going to let you just describe it to me because it was part it was part music part concert performance but part film yeah and and as as you told me that night I forgot the percentages but and then you said and it's ten percent manifesto <laughs> yeah and I love that I thought oh God I can't wait to see this that you were going to combine all of this into this experience yeah uh, in Madison Square Garden or the Barclays Center or um, you know, wherever you are in Detroit or Seattle or San Diego or whatever, but, uh, but just yeah. give me, give, can you give us just a sense of what I hope we are still going to be able to see when we're, when we're through this? Uh, uh, very, it's really, you don't have to, by the way, if I put you on the spot, I, I we, it's really, you know. it's really difficult to do it. A number of things have happened since then. One is I've written a new song that is about part of the idea. Part of the idea is 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 like I, I've set the whole show in three places. One is what I call the iCloud or just the cloud, which is the idea of a shining city, white city in the sky with only very rich people in it who are the ruling class who decide everything and make all the decisions. So that's where Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos live, up there in the sky. And then underneath them, in the shadow of the underside of the cloud, there is where the rest of us live, the netherworld, where we're all desperately trying to pay the bill at the end of the month, as we were talking about earlier, right, in, in, in our conversation here today, and where things are very, very, very difficult for almost everybody. Um, so there's that. And, and it's vaguely urban. The feeling is kind of urban, right? And then, But there's a third place, which is the one I'm sort of most interested in, and it's called The Bar. And it's expressed as a cinematic experience. So I will hire actors and I have written a script and characters will convene in this bar. But the bar is probably a dream or it's the bar is, yeah, a, a collaborative dream of people in pain because they need to speak to one another in order to figure out what, what to do or how to find their way back 
to the garden, to quote Joni Mitchell. Is, am I quoting her? It sounds like Yes, it. that's her from Woodstock. Yeah. 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 So, so that's what it's about. And it, and, that's, and it punctuates. So the journeys into the bar punctuate the rock and roll show that is done in the round with this huge monolith in the middle of it in the shape of a big kind of three-dimensional crucifix lying on its side. Not that it's not a crucifix in the Christian sense, but it is a cross. It's a huge LED screen and whatever. So those those are the elements that and quadraphonic sound and things uh, that we would play be playing with. But speaking of manifesto, funnily enough, and 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 at, at certain points, I'd ask people to say, I at certain points, and this is not what the bar is anymore because I've moved on. I thought that the bar might be where people had somehow been asked or invited to come together, to put their minds together, to decide what to do, i.e., to come up with practical solutions to how we might be able to organize the world so we don't destroy it, so that there's something left for our grandchildren and great grandchildren uh to enjoy after we're gone uh, well, that that's not how i see it anymore though the bar has a great deal to offer in terms of optimism for my deep belief in the goodness of human beings because i believe deeply in the innate goodness of human beings um so but whatever so anyway what, what i'm wow. saying yeah today before I came and did this with you, I did a long thing with um, talking to my friend BJ Prashad, and it was a program for a, a based upon a bookshop in New Delhi in India, New Delhi in India, and so and and with lots and lots of people in in the subcontinent and in, and in the rest of Asia, tuning. And I said that I would talk to him, which I did for some time, and then I said I would sing a song, and so. Um, I thought, what the hell am I going to do? Because it was only over this microphone. I couldn't record anything or do anything. So I said, I'll sing We Shall Overcome on May Day, 220, a special version. So this morning, I got up really, really early. And um, you can hear the paper rustling now. And oh, this, and would, you, I, I, would you play that for us? I can't play it now. It goes on forever. Do you think I should? Yes, please. Oh, I, I, we're, we're closing out the show here. And, and I... I, I I can't think of a better way uh, to oh, do that. Well, uh, you don't, don't have to, but it would. But well, it would, I need to turn the light on because I can't. It, um, it. For the this, but uh, this is not a drill. The the experience, the tour, everything. This will happen, I assume, at some point. Yeah, but this song's nothing to do with it. No, I know that, but I just want to let people know that are listening that um, that that will be there. Well, you just, you're very lucky that I've had a couple of glasses of Puy if we say, otherwise you would never have talked me into this. Can I read really these lyrics? Yeah. I, no, I, I, I know you don't probably want to do this, but I, I, um, it's just your name. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Michael, I love you. I love you too. Here we go. God knows if I can remember it. Cause it, but anyway, there we go. We shall overcome We shall overcome Someday Deep in my heart I do believe That we shall Overcome someday, and we'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand someday. Deep in my heart I do believe That we'll walk hand in hand One day
And we'll tear down the prison walls We will tear down the prison walls Together we will tear down the prison walls On that day Wow, never mind Deep in my heart I do believe that we will tear down all the prison walls on that day. And the truth will set us free. The truth will set us free. The truth will set us all free on that day. Deep in my heart I do believe That the truth will set us all free On that day And we'll walk hand in hand And we'll take back the land we will plant a billion trees. We will set all the people free. From Jordan to the sea. And we'll sound the alarm. Keep, keep all the women safe from home. And in Myanmar and in Kashmir. The Pinkertons will fear to tread We'll drive them from the streets And have human rights instead And in Chile and in Brazil El de Recho de Vivir Will triumph over fear and we will tear down all the prison walls In Chicago and in St. Paul In Paris and in Port Cole In the wet Suedan land We will make our stand And we will keep the water clean this is no idle dream We are many and they are few And on this first day of May We're here to have our say Today a brand new day will dawn Today a child is born The child of us all like a pebble in the rain Like a shadow smile through a veil It will take away the pain And if we cup our hands like this Like a mantis, like a dove It will settle in our palms and the child's name The child's name is love Child's name is love The child's name is love Child's name is love Wow. Um, thank you for that, Roger. Um, oh, it's all. I stack it's, it. Uh, but, you know, but yeah. it's just what it is. It, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's been, 
Sorry, I'm, it's been an honor. It's been an honor to have you here on the on my podcast. Um, it's funny and, because um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, does, it, it, it does. It hasn't feel as if it hasn't felt as if we were alone. It doesn't feel like a conversation between two people, does it? What is, what does it feel like? But I don't know. Well, there are other people listening. It feels like we're in a community of some kind, and they're listening because they love you and because they listen to your podcast and because they're interested in the idea that people have things to say and and maybe even that people have things, you know, I can, I can wobble through this all out of tune and fumbling with the guitar and blah, 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 but it doesn't matter. What's important is that it's about something. And, I, and, and when you said manifesto, I thought, bugger me, that actually this whole long list of stuff at the end of this that I jotted down this morning just because I knew I was going to be singing in a bookshop in New Delhi um, sort of so mm. it says a lot. It, it, this is it. It's over. That's it now. It will probably never appear again, and that's the end of it. But it doesn't matter because what's important is to express one's love for one's brothers and sisters in whatever way one can. And you do and I do. So it's a huge pleasure for me to be on on this on your podcast. I'm glad you've started doing a podcast because the more people like you do podcasts, the better. I know so many people who love podcasts. And I understand why. Completely. Yeah, I, there are, we aren't alone and there are many people listening to you and I right now. And, um, but I don't, when I think of them, um, I don't think of them as passive listeners to this. No, exactly. I think, I think that they are active with us and in their own ways and hopefully whatever in their daily lives or whatever they can do. Um, they're either doing it or they want to do it. They've thought about doing it. They've thought about getting involved. They've thought about whatever it is, but they're, they're not, they're not passive in this. And I think most of them know, know that. And the gift that you just gave them with that song that you scribbled down here today. Um, I, I hope we get to hear it again. I hope others get to hear it, but I, I, um, just keep doing what you've been doing for all these years. Um, I, I, I know people say this to me all the time and I'm like, oh yeah, but I really need a break. And it's like, you know, no, you can't take a break, but, but seriously, when we're through this, Roger, um, yeah. um, we need you and the world needs you. And, um, um, the voice that you continue to give to people, especially in this, what we've talked about here today, the people that are living under various oppressions, yeah. um, what are we going to do? We can't give up. We can't stop. No, well, what, what? And- well, sorry, I'm going to just, no, just that's it, yeah. say this to your audience, okay, to all the people who are listening to this. Yeah, um, I, I, I felt a sense of our community, the community of this, your podcast audience, is there, and we must never lose sight of that absolute truth that's in that one little couplet in there. We are many, all of us. We are many, and they are few. That's correct. We outnumber them. By a factor of, I have no idea what the factor is, but it's a a factor of millions to one. Millions to one. Yeah. We outnumber them. And, and they will never outnumber us and we will hold the power. Whether you don't, if you don't feel it today, you'll, that's okay. Cause when you wake up in the morning, you'll still have that power. All of us together will have that power. Yeah. And that is how, that is how we're going to find our way out of this into a better place. I totally believe that. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to do that with you and then spend this time with you here today. It's greatly mm-hmm. appreciated. All right, um, Mike. All right. I will see you when I see you. Hasta la vista. All right. Bless you. Love you. All right. You too, man. No. Okay. Thank you. And thanks everybody for listening in and joining in with us. Um, the Roger Waters here on Rumble. I'm Michael Moore um, for a better day. Take care. Take care.